Hey, welcome back, you guys. We're going to take a look at limit of a function, limit laws. If you look at this function, um, if you plug 2 in, notice that this is undefined, right? We can't have 2 squared minus 4, can't have 4 minus 4, can't divide by 0 on this thing. Um, but the question we're asking, though, is what is the limit of this? So what we're asking is as, as x approaches O A C H E S, terrible spelling, as x approaches 2 from both sides of 2, so from the right side of 2 and from the left side of 2, as x approaches 2, does it get arbitrarily close to a number? That's the question. If it does, if so, we call that the limit. L. If it does. So we would call it whatever the number that is. If it does, that's our, I'm going to erase that and just call it L. That's our limit L. Okay. Now for this one, we can't just plug it in, obviously, um, because this one's got a hole there, right? It's undefined at 2. And so what we're going to do is we're going to look at a table of values for this function, and we're going to look at it if we plug in values from the right. So let me, let's pull up decimals together, desmos.com. And then if I click that, uh, the settings thing right there, I can make a table of values right there. I'm going to create a table. And notice right there, if I had plugged 2 in, it'll tell me it's undefined, right? But I'm going to approach 2 from both sides. So let me plug in. Let's put the 2 down here where it is. And let's go to the left of 2, like negative, uh, negative 2.1. And let me get a little closer to 2 each time. So negative 2, let me plug in negative 2.01. So now I get negative 100, negative, oh, I'm sorry, good grief, from the left-hand side. Approaching two, gosh, I screwed this up. Hold up, you guys. Not negative two, sorry about that. I'm approaching two. So from the left side of two, it would be like 1.9. Let's get a little closer to two, so 1.99. Let's get a little closer to two, 1.999. A little bit closer to two, 1.9999. Now let's go to the right, and let's start with uh, 2.1. Let's get a little closer to 2, 2.01, 2.001, .001, and 2.0001. If I plug those in one by one, and I look at that, even though it's undefined at 2, and let me zoom in on this, can you see how... As I approach it from the right and I approach it from the left, let me see if I can rip this. So I can draw on it. Maybe. It's not going to let me. There we go. No. No. There we go. As I approach it from the right, from the left, even though this has a hole there, I don't care. Does it get arbitrarily close to a value? And if so, what was that value? Well, if you look back at the table of values, what were we getting really close to? So 
hopefully you can see from our uh, table values that I'm getting closer and closer and closer to a y value of one fourth, 0.25, right? 0.25, right there. So this limit is 0.25 because I'm getting arbitrarily close to it. So the limit as x goes to two, even though the function is not defined at two, we don't care. We're getting close to a y value of 1 fourth, 0.25. We're getting arbitrarily close to it. Okay. Now, the question is, since we can't just um, plug it in because it's undefined, can we algebraically solve for the limit? Yes, you can. So if you remember from your uh, pre-calculus course, if you factor this, x minus 2 over x squared minus 4. So we factor the bottom. Now this is a different function, but it behaves like, so this function behaves like 1 over x plus 2. The only difference is it doesn't have a hole there. It's defined there. That's the only difference. The two graphs are the exact same. The first one, un, the unsimplified form has a hole. This, this one does not have a hole. So since it does not have a hole and it is continuous, I could just plug the 2 in. Let's let x be 2 now. And I get it. It's 1 fourth. Okay. So when you're going to solve, table values is very helpful. Um, but algebraically, you should be able to solve most, if not all, of these. Okay. As well. And that's one approach. Let's look at these graphically for this one. Here's a different function. The limit as x goes to 2 of this function. So as I approach 1, 2, this is 2, right? As I approach 2 from the right, as I approach it from the right, what value is that? What y value is that? 1, yeah. But as I approach it from the left down here, what's the y value down there? Negative one. Do they agree? No, there's that big gap there. They don't get arbitrarily close to anything. They have to agree from both sides to have a limit. So a limit does not exist. And we move on. Okay. Again, you have to have, even if there's a hole there, as you approach, oops, as you approach, you have to agree. See how they both agree on that one? They both agree on the y value that they're going to, even though it's undefined there. How about this one? The limit as x goes to 3. Let's go ahead and look at uh, an x value 3 is right here. And I do have a, a vertical asymptote there. So as I approach 3 from the right, what's it doing? Good. So it's going up. Shoots me up to infinity, right? Shooting up to infinity. And from the left? Negative. Yeah, negative infinity. Okay. Does the limit exist? No, limit does not exist. Yeah, so if you, if you shoot to anything, again, it's got to get arbitrarily close to a value, to a y value to get close they have to agree from both sides now if i would have asked you this instead let's go the limit as x approaches five of this same function now that's a different question right as we approach five let's approach five from the left okay it goes to that y value whatever it is and let's approach x being five from the Left, I'm sorry, from the right was then the blue, from the left is in the red. Do they agree on a y value? Yes, yes they do. So whatever that y value is, let's say it's a half. I don't know what it is because I don't have the function. But I would say, oh, the limit's a half, if it is a half, right, for this function. Again, I don't have a function listed. Let's go ahead and let's look at this one here. Limit as x goes to 3. So from the right, what's it doing? Yeah, from the left, what's it doing? Yeah, so the limit actually does not exist again. Exactly, because it doesn't get arbitrarily close to value. 
functional now. Uh, and by the way, we will examine this further in a later section. We'll talk about infinite limits, uh, but we'll, we'll leave that alone for a bit. All right, let's look at this one. Number one, does the functional value exist? What is f of 1? If 1 is 3, there's our functional value. Now let's answer this. What's the limit? as x goes to 1. So from the right, it looks like it's approaching what y value? 4. Yeah, it looks like it's approaching. From the left, it's approaching what y value? 2. Do they agree? No. So it does not exist, right? It does not exist. Can't have that gap there. for They, don't, they have to get arbitrarily close to the same y value. How about as we approach negative 1? So negative 1 is over here. Left, right? From the, if I, as I approach negative one from the right, what's the y value it's approaching? Zero. As I approach it from the left, what's the y value that you're approaching? Zero. Do they agree? Yeah, so what's the limit? Zero. So make a note of all these uh, rules here. We'll go ahead and use some of these. Let's look at this first one here. The limit is x goes to 5 of 2x squared plus 7. <clears throat> so um, I'm going to do this as an overall first, and then we'll go ahead and use the properties. If I think about 2x squared plus 7, that's a polynomial, right? What do you know about polynomials? They're smooth and continuous, if you've forgotten that, right? 2x squared plus 7. This looks something like this, right? This smooth and continuous, right? I have no breaks in, no problems, no issues. So could I just plug the 5 in? The functional value should be the limit as well, right? has no problems with this. I can just plug it in. So limit, x goes to 5 of 2 times 5 squared plus 7. And that's because it's smooth and continuous. It's nice. So 2 times uh, 5 squared, 25. So 50 plus 7 is so 57 on that. Now if you're doing it with the limit properties, you could just split it up. Limit as x goes to 5 of 2x squared plus limit as x goes to 5 of 7. And then you could just go ahead and plug it in like that. Plus limit as x goes to 5. If you think about y equaling 7 when you're approaching that, it's still 7, right? Even when you approach 5 from both sides of that horizontal line. So either way, it ends up being 57, probably easier just to do it all at once. All right, how about this one? 3x squared minus x plus 2. If I'm thinking about uh, x, 3x squared minus x plus 2, I look at the denominator, I'm just thinking to myself, well, it's not defined at negative 2. But other than that, I should be fine. It'll be defined everywhere else, right? So if I plug the 2 in, I could just substitute that in. I won't have any issues. So let's go ahead and just plug it in. So we got 3 times 4, I got 12, minus 2 plus 2 is gone, and then 4. So it looks like this ends up being 3. So the limit as x approaches 2 of this function ends up being 3. Right. So whatever this thing looks like, um, as we approach 2 from the right side and from the left side, they both agree that the functional, that uh, they approach a y value of 3. They're getting arbitrarily close to 3. Okay? All right, let's keep going here. Notice if I plug in negative 3, what's going to happen here? Yeah, guys, you're on the bottom. So that, yeah, so it's going to be undefined, right? So we say, hey, if that happens, what are we going to do? Uh, we could, yeah, absolutely. We could do a table of values. We could do a table of values. It's kind of tedious is the only problem with the table of values, right? Remember, you have just a basic scientific calculator. 
on your exam. So I would go to algebraically solving this and I'd say, well, this x plus this function behaves like one over x minus three. All right, so it behaves like this function. The only difference between the two is uh, this one doesn't have a hole there at negative three. That's the only difference, right? So when you're doing this, you don't you can't substitute it in. So you take the original, you simplify it because that's referred to as a removable discontinuity. A hole is what's called a removable discontinuity. So we simplify it. Oops, that's plus three. And then we plug it in. So we got 1 over negative 3 minus 3, which is negative 1 sixth. And that's our uh, limit. It's approaching, as I approach negative 3 from both sides, it's getting arbitrarily close to a y value of negative 1 sixth. Right? Even though it wasn't actually defined there. Even though it had a hole there. Right? It still has a limit. It's still getting arbitrarily close to that. I'm going to make this a you try it problem. So why don't you just scratch this out and then we'll go ahead and put the answer up here. But go ahead and try this one. You should get your limit being a half on that one. So again, as you approach four from both sides, and as you approach four from both sides of that x value, you get arbitrarily close to one half as the y. Let's move on. Can we plug in three here? Do you have any issues plugging it in? Square root of 4 over negative 1. Hey, that's okay. I got 2 over negative 1. So negative 2. Our limit there. It's just negative 2. No problem. It's just the same as its functional value there. Let's move on. Let's look at about negative 31. Can I plug that in? Can I take a third root of a negative number? Yeah, it's okay. I'm looking for three of a kind, right? In other words, if the third root, if A equals the third root of B, that means A to the third equals B. Like for example, negative 2 is the third root of negative 8 because negative 2 to the third is negative 8. You with me on this? Uh, I'm giving you the formal definition on here. I just like to break it down. I say, well, I'm looking for 3 of a kind. Negative 27 is negative 3 times negative 3 times negative 3. There it is. There's 3 of a kind. The third root of negative 27 is negative 3. So the limit as x goes to negative 31 of the third root of x plus 4 is negative 3. No problems there. Can't take an even root of a negative number, right? We're not working... We're not working it with imaginary numbers in this course. We're working with the real numbers. Okay. All right, how about this one? Can I plug the zero in? No, okay. Uh, can I factor this? Does that help us? Nope. So we're kind of stuck. So here's another alternate algebraic approach is you can multiply by the conjugate. Is another approach. So let's go ahead and if again if this is undefined. So I'm going to multiply by square root of 2 plus x plus conjugate means I change that middle sign. Well if I do it to the top, I gotta to make sure that I do it to the bottom. Yeah. 
I know. Let's go ahead and see what we get. Square root of 2 plus x times another square root of 2 plus x. So that undoes the radical. So I got 2 plus x. And then I got plus root 2. I'll go ahead and write it. Plus root 2 root 2 plus x. And then the in, inner terms minus root 2 square root of 2 plus x. Those are like terms that cancel. Notice that. And then lastly, negative root 2 times negative root 2 is a minus root 4, which is just a minus 2 on the end. And this is all over x times root 2 plus x plus root 2. Notice your 2 minus 2, that those cancel, all right? So I'm left with on the top, I have an x over an x root 2 plus x plus root 2. Now this is what I wanted. I wanted those to cancel. Because remember, I can't throw 0 in for x until I get rid of that dang x on the bottom that's causing all my problems, right? So I'm left with now another function that behaves the same, but it doesn't have a hole there. So I got rid of my removable discontinuity. It's referred to as, right? So I can just plug a zero in. So I got 1 over root 2 plus root 2, 1 over 2 root 2. And I guess I should rationalize that. Let's go ahead and be proper about it. So root 2 over 4, or 1 over 2 root 2, same thing. All right, let's keep going. Why don't you guys try this one? Um, notice if you throw that 3 in, you've got issues. You're dividing by 0, right? So you can't throw the 3 in. So what are we going to do? And we, can't, and we can't factor. So we're going to... Multiply by the conjugate. Go ahead and try that, and then we'll... So if you get to this point, hopefully you notice before, instead of distributing the x through to both terms and the negative 3 to both terms, what you're wanting is you're wanting to get rid of that x minus 3 because that x minus 3 on the bottom is causing all the problems, right? You want to throw it in. So that's what you wanted to cancel right there. That's the whole point of that conjugate. And now you can plug that in. And you have square root of 3 plus 1 plus 2. So the square root of 4 is 2. 2 plus 2, there's your limit. The limit ends up being 4 on that. You guys have any issues there? So with these trig functions, um, you can still plug the c value into the expression to get the limit, right? Unless it's undefined, of course. Uh, you just make sure, you know, if you're rusty with your trig, you got your unit circle ready. So let's take a look at uh, the tangent, right? The limit as x goes to pi of the tangent. Well, the tangent is the sine over the cosine. So if you're looking on your unit circle, right, if I rotate pi amount, I'm right there on my unit circle, negative 1, 0. So the sine of pi is 0, cosine of pi is negative 1. So this just ends up being 0. The limit as x goes to pi of the tangent of x is 0, right? If you think about that graph of the tangent, here's pi. If you think about it, from the right, as you approach pi, from the right, you're approaching 0. From the left, you're approaching 0, aren't you? So the limit as x goes to pi of the tangent function is 0. We just did it uh, by plugging it in there. Let's go ahead and plug in similarly for this one. As we go to pi 6, right, well, so 3 times pi 6, oops, cosine of that, sorry about that. So we got cosine of 3 pi 6. Well, 3 pi 6 is pi halves. So now I'm just thinking to myself, well, what's the cosine of pi halves? And I would say 0, right? We know the cosine of pi halves. Cosine of 90 degrees is 0, the x value there. Just go ahead and try these next two, if you would. 
So we've got uh, 3 root 3 over 2 on that first one. Make sure you take the sine of pi third, sine of 60 degrees there, which is the y value there on the unit circle. Now if you notice this one, you've got the sine of theta over the cosine of theta, and co secant's 1 over cosine. Well, if you think about that, when if you plug in pi halves, cosine of pi halves, bless you, Cosine of pi halves is zero. Yeah, so you can't just plug it in right here without simplifying because that's undefined, and so is this one is undefined. Right? We can't do that. So let's go ahead and simplify it first. So we'll go ahead and multiply by the reciprocal. And notice the cosines cancel. So this ends up being limit theta goes to pi halves of just the sine of theta and now we can just plug it in so we have the sine of pi halves well the sine at 90 degrees is at that point zero one right zero comma one so sine of pi halves is all right this one we're looking at uh, the squeeze theorem the sandwich theorem which says uh, suppose you've got this in fact, let me give you a little picture of this. Let's say this is my h of x on top. And let's say in black I've got... Uh, I do that very well. It's supposed to meet fairly right there. There's my g of x on the bottom. And my f of x is just smashed in between them. Okay, there's my f of x. Okay, so f of x is less than or equal to h of x, greater than or equal to eight. Uh, g of x, for all x, uh, except possibly a c itself, okay? So if you know the limit of the h of x and the limit of the g, can you see how they both meet right there at that point? So we'll call that limit L, right? They agree, they get arbitrarily close to that. Then the F of X, which is squeezed between them, must also have the same limit. Does that make sense? So let's go ahead and uh, do that for this one. Um, notice I don't want to plug in zero because uh, it's that cosine there will be undefined, right? So uh, I want you to note uh, first of all, you know, the cosine of any value is going to be at most 1 and at least negative 1. So, right, so I'm going to start with that. And so since I know that, um, and I know x squared, let me call this step number 1, number 2. Since x squared is always positive, Right, for values greater than zero at least. Um, I can multiply everything by x squared. Multiply the inequality by x squared, and it's not going to change anything. So I'll have negative 1 x squared less than or equal to the function. Here's my function now in the middle. Right, I've squeezed it between here. And so I've got this x squared cosine of 1 over x squared is less than or equal to x squared. But it's greater than or equal to negative x squared. Let me give you a little picture of that. So here's here's my x squared, right? Here's y equals x squared. Let me give you y equals negative negative x squared. And I'm sure this is not what it looks like, but I don't care. Something like that, somewhere in there. But it's squeezed between them, right? That that x squared cosine of one over x squared is squeezed between them. And so as I'm approaching zero. Then I can say, um, here, so step three, right? So it's bounded. This function is bounded by those two functions, x squared above and negative x squared below. So hence, uh, or we know the limit of, as we go to zero, of negative x squared is the same as the limit as x goes to 0 of the positive x squared, 
both of those have a limit of zero. So by the sandwich theorem or by the squeeze theorem, we can conclude, therefore, that means by the squeeze theorem, since that function x squared cosine of 1 over x squared is squeezed between them, its limit would also be 0. Okay? And similarly, we could do that uh, for this one as well. I would start out with the same premise here. We know that the sine of 2 over x is between 1 and negative 1. And since x squared for values greater than 0 are always positive, as long as it's not 0, we can multiply everything by x squared, and we can see that it's bounded again. So number two, by multiplying by x squared, it'll be bounded. It'll be bounded on the right by x squared, bounded on the left by that negative x squared. And we know the limit of those two functions is zero. Therefore, by the squeeze theorem, limit, oh, I'm sorry, guys, this is x to the fourth. Ah, just makes no difference because it's still positive. Sorry about that. Uh, change that. Sorry about that. Again, x to the fourth positive. Also, so the limit will end up being zero, right? By the squeeze theorem. Again. Let's sum up a few things. Limits. Limits that fail to exist. Number one. If you approach a different number from the right side than you do from the left side. This is an example of that, right? If you approach something from the right, it's different from the left. If I was looking at this limit as x goes to 1 of this function, does not exist because they approach something different from the right than from the left, right? Other, other than that value at 1, other than at x approaching 1, this thing is fine, right? Uh, number 2, if it increases or decreases without bound, let's do it at 1 again. If it increases or decreases at without bounds, so this limit also, as you approach one, does not exist either, right? Even if they agree, the limit still does not exist. We'll talk about infinite, infinite limits later in the course. Uh, another situation that's kind of odd is if it oscillates, oscillates between two fixed values. So for example, let's say I have this function. Um, it's a piecewise defined function. So zero for anything less than or equal to zero, but it's the sine of one over x anytime x is greater than zero. So here it is on the left here. Here's x is less than or equal to zero. That's the left side of this. But if I was to graph sine of one over x, what this does on the right-hand side is it kind of comes in from the right, and then it just keeps bouncing back and forth. I didn't do this very smooth, obviously, but it keeps oscillating back and forth, and it, the frequency increases as you approach zero from the right. So this limit, this limit as you approach zero does not exist. Right? It just keeps oscillating back and forth. It's never going to approach a value, get arbitrarily close to a value. It just keeps oscillating. Okay, so those are your scenarios to keep in mind. Um, and then lastly, you know, your, your strategies to finding limits, we should probably note. I'd go with direct substitution if possible when appropriate. 
direct substitution when appropriate. Now, if it's like some weird function, like we'd had that graph earlier where the functional value is different, you know, don't use direct substitution on that, right? Because it'll, it'll just give you the functional value. But, you know, if it's nice, smooth, continuous, polynomial kind of thing, no problem, right? No problem on that. So think about what function you have before you just throw it in and figure it out. Um, now, if direct substitution doesn't work, then you manipulate algebraically. Manipulate algebraically. So by simplifying, so simplifying, because what you're wanting to do, you know, factoring and canceling the terms, right, is you want to write it as a simplified version without the discontinuity in it so that then you can directly substitute into a function that behaves the same. It just doesn't have the hole in it, right? That's the idea behind simplifying. The other option is if you can't, if you can't factor it, simplify it, you're going to have to use this conjugate approach, right? That's another one there. And finally, if none of that really works, guess what? Use the table of values. To reinforce this should always this should always be done to reinforce your conclusions anyways and hope that helps thanks so much for watching see you guys next time